89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. Amazon Basin, from the magnificent redwoods of California to the icy majesty of the Arctic, life on Earth faces an unprecedented threat from careless development. Join Terra Verde over lunch today to find out about the unfolding future of the planet. Hello, I'm Michelle Chan, and you're tuned to KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, or KFCF in Fresno. Welcome to Terra Verde, a weekly environmental radio show. Well, it may be cold and rainy outside, but that should not keep you from venturing into the great outdoors. In fact, one of Mother Nature's greatest wonders is occurring right around us, and winter is the prime time for it. I'm talking about animal migration. In particular... The wondrous journey of gray whales as they travel 10,000 miles from the Arctic to Mexico, one of the largest migrations or longest migrations, as, and skim the California coast, and the yearly decampment of elephant seals along selected beaches just as stones throw away from San Francisco Bay, and not to mention the return of spawning salmon into our local watersheds. It truly is one of the most spectacular times to reconnect with the rhythms of the natural world around us. And so with us on today's show as John DeLasso, Chief of Interpretation and Natural Resource Education at the Point Reyes National Seashore, will be talking with us about the gray whale migration and elephant seals which pass through and return to Point Reyes every year and tips for how to go out and watch this amazing spectacle. And on the second part of our show, we'll be talking with Preston Brown, a watershed biologist with the Salmon Protection and Watershed Network, SPAWN. So now let's turn to John. John, welcome to Terra Verde. Well, thank you very much, Michelle. It's great to be here. Well, let's start with the um, gray whales first. Um, tell us about this gray whale um, species, which we can see coming down our ho- coast. Absolutely. You know, every year we have this uh, spectacular migration that goes on, and we can almost pretty much set our calendars to it. And it's this 12,000-mile migration that the gray whale does. And the gray whales are uh, majestic creatures, as are all the whales. And over the last few years, we're actually seeing other species of whales right off of the coast. And the best vantage point within the Point Reyes National Seashore is really out at the Point Reyes Lighthouse because that headland juts out 10 miles from the California coastline. Now tell us a little bit more about the story of this migration. You know, what's, what's, really, um, what's really going on here? You know, there's, there's two things that really drive migrations typically with, with animals, and, that would, and actually even with humans. That would be food and reproduction. And that's what's going on here. So the food source for the gray whales uh, predominantly is up in Alaska. But what they're doing this time of year is they're migrating south to Baja to give birth in the warmer waters and shallow waters of the Mexican lagoons down there. So, again, every year we see this, and it typically, we, we actually have two migrations. We have the southern migration, which will typically peak around the Point Reyes area in mid-January, and we can see sometimes very easily 80 to 100 whales a day. And then it peaks again on their northern migration going back to Alaska, which is usually the middle part of March. Right. And so if a lot of this migration is driven by reproduction and wanting to give birth to calves in the Baja California area, is it really um, females that are making the migration or do we have the males doing it as well? There are males that are migrating down. There are also um, younger whales of both male and female persuasion before uh, they're at the breeding stage. And what's really spectacular, too, is on that northern trip going back to Alaska, the cows or the females who just gave birth to these calves uh, oftentimes will hug the shoreline. And what I mean by hugging, remember, these are 40 to 45 foot long creatures, um, these adults, they're just kind of out in the surf line. And many of our beaches in the spring months, as you're walking along a beach, you can actually not only 
see but hear the spout of the whale in the very shallow waters. And of course, they're doing that to stay away from any of the predators such as orca or white sharks. Right. So you have like the moms flanking on the outside and then you have the, the pups or the, 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 the babies. They're Absolutely. sort of on the inside protected. So um, what are, I mean, I imagine they're, you know, feeding in the north and then going to the south for warmth as well as I suppose more food. What are these whales eating? Well, it's interesting. What they eat um, are small little crustaceans called amphipods that aren't even really very visible. They're really small, kind of thumbnail size, if you will. And what's amazing is how they can nourish those large bodies. And again, the adult gray whale, we're talking, you know, 45 feet, 30 to 40 tons. And this is what they consume. They are Uh, baleen whales, which are the filter feeding whales, and that's most of the whales species are that way. There are a couple, such as the orca that we know, which is closer to a dolphin than a whale, which has teeth. And so they'll feed on other things from salmon to squid uh, and even uh, seals and sea lions. Right. And so if you're seeing up to 100 whales a day um, out at Point Reyes, their populations are pretty healthy, it seems. But it wasn't always that way, I imagine. No, in fact, uh, they were listed on the endangered species list back in 1969, but were actually at least the the whales that are here in the eastern Pacific Ocean, they were delisted in 1994. So they have indeed, you know, th- there are a number of wonderful success stories with wildlife where um, either hunting pressures for whatever reasons that may have been put on them um, were minimized, and we've seen a number of these different species, such as the gray whale, make a very good comeback. Fantastic. Um, So what are some of the biggest threats to gray gray whales today? Well, you know, the threats are out there. Um, We have uh, anything from, and, and this is some broader broader paintbrush strokes I'll make, but, you know, there's uh, overfishing that has gone on in our oceans, um, things that aren't as sustainable, and they can really disrupt ecosystems, which will work its way through the food chain. So even though the gray whales may not eat salmon, for example, what the salmon feed on could be impacted by things from overfishing to um, ocean acidification, which has uh, gotten worse in the last number of years, and litter. You know, we we have uh, a lot of issues with litter, and all of these issues we can address. As as humans, we've got the ability to minimize these impacts for these creatures, and, and of course, you know, it's up to us to do that. Right, and stuff like ocean ocean acidification, I mean, a lot of that comes from climate change, so it's just yet another... Another one that impacts that we're feeling from from climate change. Absolutely. So um, let's turn to some um, tips that you can give listeners for um, how they might best uh, visit Point Reyes and uh, take advantage of this incredible migration that's happening right now. Certainly. Um, And this year where, of course, you know, the National Park System is kicking off our centennial celebration. And so the national parks are... Uh, seemingly a new idea and a remarkable idea, but we've been around for a hundred years. Here at Point Reyes, we've been here since 1962 as officially as a national park unit. So there's some great things as far as uh, trip planning ideas that people need to keep in mind. Point Reyes National Seashore is very unique. We get two and a half million visitors a year, and most of our visitation is going to be on weekends. So If you can only come up on a weekend, what we typically offer during this whale watching season is a shuttle bus. So people will get filtered to Drake's Beach, which is a very large parking lot, and get on this bus. And it'll take you to the lighthouse, to another location called Chimney Rock, where we have Elephant Seal Colony, and then back to Drake's Beach. So it's a it's a wonderful little circle that you can take. And there's a lot of information on our webpage, which I'll give you later, all about that. So... But if you can actually not come out on a weekend and come out on a weekday, we do not have this mandatory shuttle, and people can drive directly to the lighthouse. And obviously, either either way, you can spend as much time as you want there. But when the weather is holding and it's there's some clear skies, uh, it's amazing what you can see. Just a week ago, I was out there, and I saw two humpback whales going by. 
So it's a, it's a, it's a special time of year to come out to the Point Reyes National Seashore. Oh, absolutely. Well, and um, we will be giving out some uh, web details so that folks can plan their trips in just a little bit. But you did mention, actually, Chimney Rock, which is where you can see elephant seals. And that's probably the other kind of um, one of the other amazing seasonal um, spectacles that we can see at Point Reyes right now. Tell us a little bit about the, about the population of elephant seals that come to Point Reyes every year. Sure. They... Um they're on a slight increase, and there's some variability uh, year by year. But uh, right now, you know, we're probably in the range of 1,500 to 2,000 northern elephant seals that come onto our beaches, usually around November. Um, and, and the large males, that, as we refer to them as bulls, they come onto the beach and kind of lay claim to a certain beach section. Uh, then the females who have already been impregnated, they then come onto the beach and typically by very late December, early January, they start to have their pups and they'll nurse these pups. And it's amazing because that that milk that they're nourishing them with is 58% fat. So you can only imagine how much weight these little pups put on in a hurry. And literally in about a month after they're born, typically they're weaned from their mothers. And of course, um, even on our social media pages, that famous elephant seal Tole, who was out on Highway 37 just a couple of weeks ago, she was brought out to Point Reyes and actually gave birth to a pup just a couple of days after she was out here. That's amazing. So essentially what you get to see when you, you go to Point Reyes, or I suppose Año Nuevo as well, um, mm-hmm. which is just down south, right. uh, is um, the potential of all kinds of... Um, Births, you also get to see a lot of fighting. There was uh, a docent at Enyana Wave who kind of called it a sex and violence show. So, um, <laughs> kind of so is, yeah, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about a little bit more about what you'll see because there, sure. there's a lot of action actually. <laughs> no, there really is. Um, you know, although you know the drama is what we're always thinking we see, and when you get that little five second caption of a video on some nature program, it's typically two of these large elephant seal bulls raising their heads out of the water or on a beach and then striking their chests. And then the chest plates that they have are heavily, heavily scarred. Um, we often refer to that as a face only a mother could love because they're so beat up. And it's spectacular to watch that. However, however, I would guess that probably 22 hours out of the day they're sleeping honestly when you look at these guys on the beach and you're there maybe sometimes for an hour just witnessing them there's not a lot of action there's a lot of talking that goes on and a lot of sparring that is almost fighting um so yeah we like to think of the spectacularness of these creatures and they are just gorgeous to see and watch but they are busy that you know the pups are nursing from their mothers there's yearlings there from the previous year that are kind of active and moving around Around. And then there's, of course, our, our friends, the very large bulls. And when they are active, I will say it is quite a show. Yeah, well, and you can't blame them for doing a lot of resting because they spend, what, you know, eight or ten months out in the open ocean just essentially not stopping. So That's correct. You can, you can cut them a little slack if, <laughs> if they're resting while you, while you visit. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell me, do, you, do we actually get the same individuals uh, coming back? to particular beaches or do they just do the elephant seals just kind of come back to any one of the beaches along the california coast um for example and and aren't as that particular about it it's uh, it's not that random no they they actually um where they're born they there's a high frequency of them coming back to that location uh, or at least very close and the converse of that, just to, to be honest, too, is we have had pups that have been born here at Point Reyes, and um, young seals do get tagged, not the pups, but the, the yearlings will get tagged. And if they're tagged at Año Nuevo or Point Reyes or some other location, there's different color tags and different coating that goes on the tags. One of our pups, when it was about three or four years old, but a pup that was born here was actually seen by a scientist who photographed it with the tag in Russia. And they sent that information back to our biologist. So it's pretty amazing how far they can go. Um, but yes, there, there is a real frequency of them coming back to the area that they're very familiar with. That is amazing. So John Delasso, um of Point Reyes National Seashore, 
give us some info in terms of um, phone numbers and websites and whatnot so that our listeners who might be inspired to get out there um, will be able to plan their trip. Absolutely. So um, our phone number at the Bear Valley Visitor Center, which is one of our three visitor centers but is open seven days a week, is area code 415-464-5137. And for those that have access to the Internet, if you go to our webpage, there it is chock full of information, and that is nps.gov and then a forward slash P-O-R-E, and those are the first two letters of our name, Point Reyes, and you've now cracked the code for every National Park Unit website, just in case you were wondering, and you just take those first two letters of the names, or if it's a one-word park like Yosemite, then it'd be the first four letters. So pretty easy to find the National Parks online, and again, uh, we're all celebrating this great centennial anniversary this year for the National Park System. Uh, thanks for that pro tip, John. Um, again, the Bear Valley Visitor Center, which is open seven days a week, can be reached at 415-464-5137. You can also visit them online at nps.gov forward slash P-O-R-E. Well, John DeLasso, thank you so much for joining us and for um, inspiring us to get out. Well, thank you, Michelle. This was great. This is Terra Verde 94.1 on KPFA, KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. I'm Michelle Chan, your host, and you are listening to the voice of John DeLasso of the Point Reyes National Seashore. Well, next we'll be turning to a guest we have in studio, Preston Brown, who is a watershed biologist with the Salmon Protection and Watershed Network, also known as SPAWN, who will be talking about one of the other um, spectacular migrations that uh, we get to witness here, us lucky folks in the Bay Area, and that is um, Coho Salmon. So thank you so much, Preston. Good morning. So um, it is spawning season for salmon here in the Bay Area, and um, tell us what kinds of salmon we have here and uh, what we would see this month, for example, if we came out with your organization on a creek walk. So these are Central California Coast coho salmon. Uh, so that that's a range from Mendocino to Big Sur, uh, and their largest population in that range is the Lagunitas Creek watershed in West Marin. Uh, so this time of year, uh, the adults are swimming upstream to the streams where they were born, and the females are digging nests, and the males are fighting with one another, looking to compete and lay their their eggs with uh, females. Right. And tell us a little bit about this amazing journey, because I think that's one of the things that fascinates people about salmon is that, for example, that, you know, there's such a dramatic story to their life, so to speak. It's kind of miraculous. These fish basically appear out of nowhere. Uh, they, They follow the rains starting in November with the beginning beginnings of our, our winter season, uh, the first couple of rains start their uh, their trigger, so they they start to move upstream with the first rain. And, and these are some of them are just out in the open ocean. They're out in the open ocean. Yeah, they're they're uh, kind of hugging the the continental shelf. Um, this time of year, their their bodies are telling them it's time to spawn, it's time to reproduce. So they use uh, many different factors. They sense water chemistry. They use magnetic fields to navigate back to their relatively their home watershed, uh, and then they wait for the rains to bring them upstream. Well, that is amazing. And then once they're going upstream and they, I mean, it, again, I suppose John had said the reasons why migrations occur basically are about food and about reproduction, and this is really all about reproduction. That's right. Yeah, yeah. so these these fish are uh, attracted to this water. They, they were... Uh, they spent a year and a half in this water, so it's it's within their bones that that it's um, mineralized and and they can feel it and they know it. So they're swimming up this creek, um, looking for places to the females looking for places to lay their their uh, nests, which are called reds, and they're essentially uh, shallow uh, saucer shaped pits uh, in fast moving riffles, and they lay their eggs there. Uh, in these pits once they're dug and of appropriate size and scale. And uh, meanwhile, males are uh, swimming with, with one another, fighting each other off, waiting for the females to be ready to mate. And it's really uh, a, a charismatic uh, species to witness do this. They oftentimes are, are um, 12 to 18 inches long, 15 to 20 pounds, the males are, and they're swimming in pretty shallow water. Uh, they basically are, are sw- oriented upstream they're they're looking upstream they basically float 
uh, in the water and kind of rocket through riffles and jump over waterfalls. Uh, but they're they're highly visible, and it's it's amazing to witness this because it's one of the most miraculous things about these forests is these fish uh, swim up. They they make a bunch of noise. It's really charismatic. Uh, but the the amazing thing is. All the other wildlife really focuses on the creek, and you see all different species of animals. And if you get a chance to see this uh, this phenomenon in Alaska or British Columbia, uh, where there's still large predators, uh, wolves, grizzly bears, uh, huge numbers of, of osprey and eagles, and river otters just, just flood the creeks in search for these salmon. So uh, the, the beautiful thing about these fish are they are the kind of the key ingredient in these in these Pacific forests. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty miraculous to watch. Well, and so, you know, we have covered um, on the show before uh, essentially the state of the populations, of our local populations of coho salmon. And um, it's, not, I mean, generally not looking, looking good, but give us, a, give us a status update. So to give you some context, uh, the population of, of the Lagunitas Creek watershed uh, historically of salmon was about four to 5,000 fish every year running up the creek to spawn. Uh, this year we've seen about just over 400 and there is a recovery goal uh set by the national marine fishery service or NOAA fisheries uh as 2600 fish so that's the the recovery goal that number 2600 has to be seen over many years uh and this year we've got about 400 so uh it's it's critical uh that these fish are better protected they they've been on a precipitous decline really since the 1940s um, right. so it's 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 really hard to say if, if it's good year or bad year but would you put it in the larger context every year since many years ago it's 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 still a bad year right yeah and uh, you and you read some very very early california writing and you you read about descriptions of being able to practically walk on top of the backs of salmon you know, because these creeks and rivers are so chock full of them, and it's just such a far, far cry from that um, these days. So, I mean, t- tell us what the the, the biggest threats to um, coho salmon are these days. Well, the unique thing about salmon and what makes them so vulnerable is they have to live both in the freshwater environment and the saltwater environment. Um, so in the saltwater, there's ocean acidification that's changing the way uh, food is migrating and, and uh, climate change in these large uh, ocean events such as the El Nino where we're happening now. Um, but in the in the freshwater, too, Dams, water infrastructure, development, uh, agriculture, uh, the urbanization, really, um, these all contribute to, to most of the, the declines in, in Central California. Right, right. And uh, you, you, we also talk about there being sort of good years or bad years for salmon. And a lot of times it's associated with whether or not we're getting rain or not. And so this year, I mean, well, how should I say? The last couple of weeks, we've been getting a lot of rain. Is this considered a quote-unquote good year, or is there actually more that goes into your consideration of what's good rather um, in addition to just volume of water? Timing is, uh, plays a big role in that. So uh, I think for, fortunately this year the, uh, some of our early rains uh, were, were kind of light and they soaked into the ground well, and that's allowed a lot of the ground to absorb these bigger storms that we've had this week and, and are looking like we're having next week. Uh, and that, and that, that's beneficial because a lot of that water can, can absorb into the ground, feed the creek later on in the summer and, and warmer months, uh, and doesn't just run off. And, and when it runs off, not only do we lose that groundwater uh, recharge, but we also get a lot of surface erosion from, from bare grounds, urban surfaces, and uh, the, these recent rains have, have actually swelled the creeks just enough to, to a good amount, let the fish come up and, and access multiple uh, creeks and their headwaters, which they really need. Right, right. Well, and um, one of the things that we were talking about um, just uh, a second ago were all of these different threats to our local salmon populations and um, essentially habitat impact and development are really, really big ones. Tell us about this campaign that um, Spawn is running to pass an ordinance, actually, to protect San Geronimo. Yeah, so we are trying to enact a, a, a common-sense, science-based ordinance in Marin County, specifically in the San Geronimo watershed, which is the largest undammed water stream in, in Lagunitas, which is significant. 
And what this campaign is about is just to enact simple ordinance rules that that uh, the county can can follow, and it just protects streams from streamside development. It's really simple. Um, and this this kind of ordinance has been passed in Sonoma County, in Santa Cruz County, in multiple counties in California and across the country. So it's nothing new. Uh, and the Marin County Board of Supervisors have been reluctant to do it. Um, and so right now we're at a point where, where we're hoping that we, we, can, we can make this happen. We have a lot of momentum and we have a photo campaign. So people can download from our website uh, if they go to seaturtles.org slash wild coho salmon, can download a petition. And what it is, is, is it says you, you can fill out your name and where you live, hold it up, print it out, hold it up, take a picture of yourself and email it to us. And we found that is extremely effective at getting the attention of the supervisors. If we have a photo with people saying where they live and why they care about salmon, uh, it's been huge, and, and we've generated a lot of support with that. And you're finding that it's effective even if the people that are doing it don't live right in or near the watershed, even if the even if the support comes from miles and miles away, out of state, et cetera? Absolutely. The, these fish are a public trust. They belong to everyone, and they're federally endangered, so they belong to every United States citizen. Um, so that that's even more impetus that, that this ordinance needs to be passed as, as they – they have a, a a place in all of our role and the role in all of our lives. Yeah. Um, and another thing that a spawn is working on is this um, raise a redwood project. And tell me a little bit about that. So we have an initiative called Ten Thousand Redwoods. Uh, it, it began as as an attempt to to raise a couple thousand trees for some specific large scale uh, floodplain restoration projects we have. And then we decided, you know what? Let's let's blow it up. Let's do something really big. And and people love the idea of planting redwoods and redwoods not only benefit coho salmon uh, but benefit from coho salmon uh, but but redwoods also sequester tremendous amounts of carbon uh, so it's a way that we can mitigate the effects of climate change globally while having a project locally yeah well, tell us a, tell us a little bit more about this connection between coho salmon and redwoods in particular because it's sort of cool you've got the salmon organization that is essentially doing redwoods um, you know, planting and the connection between that those two species is really quite special. They're very tied. Uh, th- the evolution of these central and northern California coast coho salmon have evolved particularly with these old growth conifer forests, usually associated with redwoods. Uh, but we have a saying that we tell people that redwoods or uh, fish tr- salmon grow on trees. <laughs> uh, but but what that means is. Redwoods provide really critical habitat for endangered salmon and and what by having redwoods grow next to a creek, they protect the creek from uh, sunlight and heat uh, can also absorb fog and help the the groundwater uh, recharge uh, but they provide habitat for insects that fish eat uh, but also they provide dead wood uh, to the creek that falls in and creates pockets of deep pools and areas where fish can seek refuge from storms and rear when they're young. Uh, but on the other side of the equation, uh, when salmon come back to spawn, redwoods actually benefit from the nutrients uh, in their bodies. That when the, when the fish spawn, they, they die. So whether they die in the stream or get carried by a, a turkey vulture or a raccoon or whatever, uh, their nutrients get recycled into the riparian forest. And so redwoods generally have more, uh, they they grow bigger and they grow taller next to coho streams. That is a really cool connection. Well, Preston, thanks so much for... um giving us the download um give us your website again and your uh, and or your e- um sorry and or your phone number so that folks can get our website is seaturtles.org slash salmon we have uh a, a phone number if, if you're interested in, in joining our photo campaign you can uh, follow us at seaturtles.org slash wild save wild salmon we also have events uh through the end of january to to witness these coho salmon spawning that's seaturtles.org slash creek walks. Uh, we also have volunteer opportunities, seaturtles.org slash events. Wonderful. Thanks so much at seaturtles.org slash salmon or creek walks or um, save wild salmon. Thank you so much, Preston, for joining us. And to Erica Bridgman, our engineer. Please tune in next week when Terra Verde will be featuring an in-depth episode on Southern California gas's massive natural gas leak in the Porter Ranch area outside L.A. We hope you do join us, and we hope you have a great weekend. Uh, hi.
The KPFA Community Advisory Board gathers information from organizations and community members about the programming and policies of KPFA. You are invited to join us and share your ideas and information at our next Community Advisory Board meeting on Sunday, January.